Welcome to the Retzel Health Law Hotspot. Health Law Hotspot is a podcast for physicians and health professionals that covers the legal issues and trends that affect the healthcare industry. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Health Law Hotspot. I'm Erica Adler, shareholder and leader of the healthcare practice at Retzel and Andrus. Today, I want to talk about residents and fellows who may be in the process of reviewing their contracts. It's that time of year where I get many phone calls from doctors coming out of training to review their contracts, and they always seem to have the same question. So today I wanted to cover six of the major items I think that a young doctor needs to think about when it comes time to reviewing their contract. First of all, do your research on the employer why are they hiring you? Do they have a lot of turnover? Are people happy there? Uh, what kind of feedback do you get from people who have worked there? Are they treated fairly? Are they happy? Doing this kind of research is important so that you can get a better sense of what that employer is really like um, before you start the process. If you hear things you don't like, you don't have to continue. And instead, you might consider other offers. Second, although you may be a great doctor, you didn't go to law school, and you may not be familiar with physician contracts. So what I do recommend is that you seek assistance in reviewing your contract. That means talking to somebody who's familiar with physician contracts, not necessarily a family member who went to law school. And certainly, I do not recommend relying on a mentor or the head of your training program. Although they may have some good insight, they're looking at things a little bit differently than a lawyer might. There are lots of recommendations that a lawyer can typically make to improve the contract, to make sure you fully understand it, to propose alternatives, to help you understand uh, the pros and cons of the contract. So I think it's worth it to talk to somebody um, who has the expertise, just like you don't want patients, you know, going on Google or getting advice uh, from another source that's not an expert. You really want to talk to someone to get good advice on your contract. As you start your process of reviewing the contract, it's important to remember that now is the time to ask the questions you want to ask. So many physicians tell me that they wish they'd asked that question, but they were afraid or they were uh, too shy um, or whatever the reason may be. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Questions are never offensive. Demands are offensive. If you're uncertain how to phrase your question, work on it with your counsel. Uh, but generally, uh, a question such as, could you explain this to me? Or um, can you help me understand this? Or is there a possibility of, et cetera, um, you know, are really good examples of ways to ask questions when you're uncertain. In the worst case scenario, they say no, but at least you won't regret never asking the question. And this question asking could be um, understanding the contract, asking for uh, a signing bonus, asking for an increase in compensation, uh, whatever your questions may be. When it comes to money, I know people are especially sensitive uh, and afraid to ask, but um, certainly if you phrase it properly, nobody's going to be offended by your question. Another piece of advice that I want to offer doctors is to focus on what's important to you. Just because your lawyer marks up the document or gives you a list of 50 things that they wanted to comment about in the contract does not mean you raise all of those questions. I think it's really frustrating to an employer to get a list of questions when most of them are not things that you care that much about. So, you know, you don't need to share with them you know, typos and the way your lawyer would prefer something be rephrased when those are innocuous uh, in meaning. What you do want to focus on are things that are important to you. Is it the call, the schedule, the location? Uh, is it the non-compete, the compensation? What is important to you? What are deal breakers for you? What is less important? What is not important at all? You need to prioritize those questions and 
go in the order of priority. If you cannot get past those deal breakers, you don't need to continue the conversation because obviously that's a contract you may not want to sign. But I think it's really important to focus on that. It can be very overwhelming for an employer to receive a, a red line document or a lengthy list of demands when at the end of the day, those really aren't all important to the doctor. Um, also, since you're the client, when it comes to working with a lawyer, I also recommend that you direct a lawyer to try and focus on substantive issues. It can be very frustrating to receive a list of, of silly issues and comments and also a red line with rewording of, um, of comments in a document. So everybody writes things a little bit differently, but that doesn't necessarily change the meaning. I, I don't want typically to hear how another lawyer would have written it when the end result is the same. I do want to hear what the doctor is concerned about, um, how much money the doctor is looking for, et cetera. So really try and direct your lawyer as well to help you focus on important issues. Another really important thing to understand, and really maybe the most important, in my opinion, is what happens if things don't work out? Do you understand your exit strategy? This involves understanding how you give notice. Are you locked in? Can you only give notice on a certain date? How much notice? What happens if you don't give proper notice? Are there damages? Do you have to repay money? Do you lose a bonus if you don't leave on a certain date? All of these are really important things to understand so you can strategize when the time comes to be able to leave and minimize the harm. Other things to think about include whether you have to pay back certain amounts and what the timing is on repaying those amounts, whether there's a non-compete, when does the non-compete kick in? Does it change based on when you give notice? Do you understand the non-compete? Can you live with it? Um, and of course, issues such as malpractice and tail are important as well. Um, does the reason you're leaving um, affect whether you're responsible for a tail? Does timing affect whether you're responsible for a tail or how much of the tail you're responsible for? I really like to focus my doctors on the exit strategy. Um, I often try to get contracts changed to make improvements, but Often we can't, especially with larger employers. So my job really is to make sure that there are no surprises in that contract. If you do not understand what the contract says and do not understand how you get out of the contract and what will happen when you give your notice or are terminated, then I haven't done my job. So really understanding the contract should be the primary goal of your lawyer, aside from, of course, trying to get those changes that are possible. Okay, so finally, one of the last things I really want to point out is that a lot of times my doctors uh, have interviews, meetings, they have phone calls, they text back and forth, or they email back and forth, and there's a lot of detail that's given to them. Maybe it's their schedule, their call, maybe it is um, the staffing that's going to be provided to them or where they're going to be working. But then when we get the contract, none of that detail's in there, and when we ask for it, we're often told, oh, you know, you're only going to work there. We won't send you anywhere else, even though the contract says you can be sent anywhere. Um, similarly, you know, you may have spoken about a very specific schedule, a very specific call, but the document just says you work when you're told to work. You take call when you're told to take call. Maybe you were told there's a cap. You can't take more than X amount of call. And yet the contract doesn't say anything like that. So those are really important because if it's not in the contract, if you're just told this verbally and we never get it in there, it is very hard to enforce down the road. So when the employer doesn't keep their word, how do you call that a breach? It was never really promised you. And typically in most physician contracts, You'll see a section called an integration provision or an entire agreement provision. And what it tells you is that that agreement is intended to be your entire understanding. It replaces any prior discussions. It replaces any side documents, emails, et cetera, even your offer letter. So if you've got things in your offer letter that didn't make it into the contract, you want to make sure you get it moved in there or you want to make a cross reference to that offer letter. So I know this is a lot to think about and there's certainly other issues, but I would say that these are the top six things that I would want 
physicians who are looking at a contract, and it doesn't have to be someone necessarily coming out of training, but every physician who's looking at a contract should take these into consideration in order to help them achieve the best contract possible, to have the smoothest process, and hopefully the best outcome. Thanks for joining me. This is the Health Law Hotspot, and I'm Erica Adler. Thanks. The Retzel Health Law Hotspot is made available by the firm and its attorneys for educational purposes and to provide general information, not to provide specific legal advice. Use of the Retzel Health Law Hotspot does not create an attorney-client relationship between you and the firm or any of its attorneys. The Retzel Health Law Hotspot should not be used as a substitute for competent legal advice, and you should contact an attorney in your state about any legal needs or questions you may have.